The Nutcracker and the Mouse King by E.T.A. Hoffman Narrated by Zach Walls Chapter 7 The Story of the Hard Nut Pirlipat's mother was the wife of a king, and therefore a queen, and Pirlipat straightway at the moment of her birth a true princess. The king was beside himself with joy when he saw his beautiful daughter as she lay in the cradle. He shouted aloud, danced, jumped about upon one leg, and cried again and again, Ha-ha! Was there ever anything seen more beautiful than my little Pirlipat? Thereupon all the ministers, generals, presidents, and staff officers jumped about upon one leg like the king and cried aloud, no, never. And it was so in truth, for as long as the world has been standing, a lovelier child was never born than this very Princess Pirlipat. Her little face seemed made of lilies and roses, delicate white and red. Her eyes were of living sparkling azure, and it was charming to see how her little locks curled in bright golden ringlets. Besides this, Pirlipat had brought into the world two rows of little pearly teeth, with which, two hours after her birth, she bit the High Chancellor's finger as he was examining her features too closely, so that he screamed out, "'Oh, Gemini!' Others assert that he screamed out, "'Oh, crikey!' But on this point authorities are at the present day divided. Well, little Pirlipat bit the High Chancellor's finger and the enraptured land knew now that some sense dwelt in Pirlipat's beautiful body. As has been said, all were delighted. The queen alone was very anxious and uneasy, and no one knew wherefore, but everybody remarked with surprise the care with which she watched Pirlipat's cradle. Besides that the doors were guarded by soldiers, and not counting the two nurses, who always remained close by the cradle, Six maids, night after night, sat in the room to watch. But what seemed very foolish, and no one could understand the meaning of it, was this. Each of these six maids must have a cat upon her lap, and stroke it the whole night through, and thus keep it continually purring. It is impossible that you, dear children, can guess why Peer the Pat's mother made all these arrangements. But I know and will straightway tell you. It happened that once upon a time many great kings and fine princes were assembled at the court of Pilipat's father, on which occasion much splendor was displayed, the theaters were crowded, balls were given, and tournaments held almost every day. The king, in order to show plainly that he was in no want of gold and silver, was resolved to take a good handful out of his royal treasury and expend it in a suitable manner. Therefore, as soon as he had been privately informed by the overseer of the kitchen that the court astronomer had predicted the right time for killing, he ordered a great feast of sausages, leaped into his carriage, and went himself to invite the assembled kings and princes to take a little soup with him in order to enjoy the agreeable surprise which he had prepared for them. Upon his return, he said very affectionately to the queen, You know, my dear, how extremely fond I am of sausages. The queen knew at once what he meant by that, and it was this that she should take upon herself, as she had often done before, the useful occupation of making sausages. The Lord Treasurer must straightway bring to the kitchen the great golden sausage kettle, and the silver chopping knives and stew pans. A large fire of sandalwood was made, the queen put on her damask apron, and soon the sweet smell of the sausage meat began to steam up out of the kettle. The agreeable odor penetrated even to the royal council chamber, and the king, seized with a sudden transport, could no longer restrain himself. With your permission, my lords, he cried, and leaped up, ran as fast as he could into the kitchen, embraced the queen, stirred a little with his golden scepter in the kettle, and then, his emotion being quieted, returned calmly to the council. The important moment had now arrived, 
when the fat was to be chopped into little pieces, and browned gently in the silver stew-pans. The maids of honor now retired, for the queen, out of true devotion and reverence for her royal spouse, wished to perform this duty alone. But just as the fat began to fry, a small, whimpering, whispering voice was heard. "'Give me a little of the fat, sister. I should like my part of the feast. I, too, am a queen. Give me a little of the fat.' The queen knew very well that it was Lady Mouserings who said this. Lady Mouserings had lived these many years in the king's palace. She maintained that she was related to the royal family, and that she was herself a queen in the kingdom of Mausalia, for which reason she held a great court under the hearth. The queen was a kind and benevolent lady, and although she was not exactly willing to acknowledge Lady Mouserings as a true queen and sister, yet she was very ready to allow her a little banquet on this great holiday. She answered, therefore, Come out then, Lady Mouse Rings. You are welcome to a little of the fat. Upon this, Lady Mouse Rings leaped out very quickly and merrily, jumped upon the hearth, and seized with her dainty little paws one piece of fat after the other as the queen reached it to her. But now all the cousins and aunts of the Lady Mouse Rings came running out, besides her seven sons, rude and forward rogues, who all fell at once upon the fat, and the terrified queen could not drive them away. But as good fortune would have it, the chief maid of honor came in at this moment and chased away the intruding guests so that a little of the fat was left. The king's mathematician being summoned demonstrated very clearly that there was enough remaining to season all the sausages, if distributed with the nicest judgment and skill. Drums and trumpets were now heard without, and all the invited potentates and princes, some on white palfreys, some in crystal carriages, came in splendid apparel to the sausage feast. The king received them kindly and graciously, and then, adorned with crown and scepter, as became the monarch of the land, seated himself at the head of the table. Already in the first course, that of the sausage balls, it was observed that he grew pale and paler, raised his eyes to heaven, gentle sighs escaped from his bosom, and he seemed to undergo great inward suffering. But in the second course, which consisted of the long sausages, he sank back upon his throne, sobbing and moaning, held both hands to his face, and at last wept and groaned aloud. All sprang up from the table. The royal physician tried in vain to feel the pulse of the unhappy monarch. A deep-seated, unknown torture appeared to agitate him. At last, after much anxiety, and after the application of some very strong remedies, the king seemed to come a little to himself, and stammered out scarce audibly the words, Too little fat! Then the queen threw herself in despair at his feet, and sobbed out, "'Oh, my poor unhappy royal husband! Alas, how great must be the suffering which you endure! But see the guilty one at your feet! Punish, punish her without mercy! Alas, Lady Mouse Rings, with her seven sons and aunts and cousins, have eaten up the fat, and—' With these words she fell right over backwards in a swoon. Then the king, full of rage, leaped up and cried out, Chief maid of honor, how happened that? The chief maid of honor told the story, as much as she knew of it, and the king resolved to take vengeance upon Lady Mouse Rings and her family for having eaten up the fat of his sausages. The privy council was called, and it was resolved to summon Lady Mouse Rings to trial and confiscate all her estates. But as the king was of the opinion that in the meanwhile she might eat up more of his sausage fat, the affair was placed at last in the hands of the royal watchmaker and mechanist. This man, whose name was the same as mine, to wit, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer, engaged, by means of a very singular and deep political scheme, to drive Lady Mouserings and her family from the palace forever. 
He invented, therefore, several curious little machines in which a piece of toasted fat was fastened to a thread, and these Drosselmeyer placed around Lady Mouserings' dwelling. Lady Mouserings was much too wise not to see through Drosselmeyer's craft, but all her warnings, all her entreaties were of no avail. Every one of her seven sons and many of her cousins and aunts went into Drosselmeyer's machines, and as they tried to snap away the fat, were caught by an iron grating, which fell suddenly down behind them, and were afterwards miserably slaughtered in the kitchen. Lady Mouserings, with the little remnant of her family, forsook the dreadful place. Grief, despair, revenge filled her bosom. The court reveled in joy at this event, but the queen was very anxious, for she knew the disposition of Lady Mouserings, and was very sure that she would not suffer the death of her sons to go unavenged. In fact, Lady Mouserings appeared one day, when the queen was in the kitchen, preparing a harslet hash for her royal husband, a dish of which he was very fond, and said, My sons, my cousins, and aunts are destroyed. Take care, queen, that Mouse Queen does not bite thy little princess in two. Take good care. With this, she disappeared and was not seen again. But the queen was so frightened that she let the hash fall into the fire, and thus a second time Lady Mousering spoiled a favorite dish for the king, at which he was very angry. But this, dear children, said Drosselmeyer, is enough for tonight, the rest at another time. Maria, who had her own thoughts about this story, begged Godfather Drosselmeyer very hard to go on, but she could not prevail upon him. He rose, saying, Too much at once is bad for the health. The rest tomorrow. As the counselor was just stepping out of the room, Fred called out, Tell me, Godfather Drosselmeyer, is it then really true that you invented mouse traps? How can you ask such a silly question? said his mother. But the counselor smiled mysteriously, and said in an undertone, Am I a skillful watchmaker, and yet not able to invent a mouse trap? End of chapter 7 For more audiobook narrations and classroom literature, subscribe to the channel. Comment below to suggest a narration, and ring the bell for notifications.